who had been kicked really, really hard by the establishment and stood up and st dusted themselves off and maintained their ethical line uh, and their direction. So we brought him in to talk about mind effects. And Ben Eastland actually was, was pretty interesting. And, and what he said is that when he, when he went to DARPA, and he knew Tony Tether on a first-name basis. He was running DARPA at the time and most of the directors. And when he went around and sort of talked to them about um, mind effects, um, what he said to me is when I asked him to come to the conference, he said, well, on a scale of 1 to 10, uh, 10 being the least interesting, uh, two, three years ago, I would have said no. He said, but now it's a one or a two because as he went through DARPA, nobody was laughing anymore. They take it very seriously. Uh, I mentioned I have a website. There's some do DARPA documents there that deal with this subject that are unclassified. We have probably seven, 800 pages of documents there, uh, materials there, um, and, it's, and that stuff's all free. I encourage you to go there. It's earthpulse.com, E-A-R-T-H-P-U-L-S-E.com. Um, so... The mind effects issue became important to me um, and was important prior to getting involved in, in this work. Um, and, and I want to talk about some of the things that, these are just to remind me so I don't forget. Uh, this book, Between Two Ages, um, this is uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski. Many of you remember him. He's one of the founders of the Trilateral Commission. He was National Security Advisor to Jimmy Carter when he was President of the United States. Um, this book was written when he was at Columbia University uh, back in the early 1970s. Um, what's important in, in this book from my perspective is if you read it today, it's a history. It's not a forecast. It talks about what would happen as a result of technologies um, from, the, from the Americas, Africa, Europe, Eastern Europe, uh, Asia. If you read it today, it's, it's a, it, it is so right on in terms of his predictions. And some would say it wasn't a prediction. It was a conspiracy. If you're in his shoes, it was planned. We already talked about that. Uh, but it did happen. Okay, now on page 54 to 56 of this book are some really important things. And there were some observations, some quotes from an earlier publication called Unless Peace Comes, which was published in uh, 1969. And in that, there was a chapter uh, called How to Wreck Your Environment, which this is before Earth Day, 1969, so people were still thinking in that frame. And, and as, we, as I said earlier, even conservatives in Europe are awake enough to realize you can't destroy this planet without destroying yourself. Uh, and I, I appreciate all of that. But what he said, what, uh, what, he, what he quoted was a guy named uh, J.F. Gordon MacDonald. Um, uh, MacDonald was a science advisor to Lyndon Johnson. He was a professor of uh, geophysics um, at, at uh, UCLA. And what he said is, if we could ever figure out how to electronically stroke the ionosphere in just the right way, we could return a signal to the Earth that would manipulate the behavior um, of populations over huge geographic areas. Now, what was important about that is, in 1969, when he made that quote, and in the early 70s when it was re-quoted by Brzezinski, the technology, as far as we know, didn't exist. Um, HARP provided that way to electronically stroke the ionosphere uh, in just the right way. Now, going back to this slide, this is a high-frequency transmitter that, through uh, primary and secondary effects, can actually cover 16 decades of frequency, everything from very low frequency to visible light um, by manipulating the signal and manipulating um, components of the natural environment. Think about it um, as if you're plugging in with this little bitty small transmitter into the Earth and then being able to manipulate the Earth by manipulating the energy itself and being able to capitalize on that energy, which is a huge amount of energy that the Earth has available to it, if you could figure out how to trigger it. And that's really what a lot of HARP was all about. Now, this idea of Earth penetrating tomography in the ELF range, within that range, um, if we think about sort of where our brains are at, um, in our deepest states of sleep, one to four hertz, delta state, where we're really out cold. Theta, um, running approximately four to seven hertz, or pulses per second, vibrations per second. Um, this is where you are in that kind of twilight stage between awake and asleep, where you're conscious of your dreams. Um, this is where three to six-year-olds spend most of their time. You know, and if you, I have five children, you know, I, I remember this. I got four grandchildren, I remember this. You know, they, they confuse the imaginary with, with the real, because this is where they're at. And, and we call them attention deficit disordered, and they're not. This is their normal state of consciousness, which is why Europeans are way ahead of the game. They generally don't start their children in school until around seven. Um, which makes sense because then they're ready for the academic learning. Um, approximately 7 uh, to, to 12 hertz or pulses per second, the alpha range, that zone if you're an athlete or a writer, that creative place. I mean, the ideal state of learning is there. And then above that range, uh, the beta ranges, and then, and then further up where you get increasingly more agitated um, the higher that uh, frequency goes. What, what there is and has been discovered, and, and the book I'm out of now is uh, Controlling the Human Mind, um, what they discovered is frequency following response. FFR. This is the idea of the brain locking onto an external signal, beginning to mirror that signal, um, and essentially locking onto that external signal. And these don't have to be very powerful, they just have to be within the window frequencies that the brain will recognize, and then you begin to follow them. Consequently, your emotional state can be altered or changed 
on a, on a pretty mass uh, scale. Now, if you're near field, you have uh, something near you that has a stronger signal within the, uh, approximately the same ranges, you'll tend, to, you'll tend to move that direction versus something that's very weak coming from um, the ionosphere. But this did exactly what uh, J.F. Uh, McDonald suggested, is the ELF range could be generated and then this uh, frequency following response created in large segments of the population. From my perspective, this became really, really important. And now that everybody's taken my copy of Earth Rising the Revolution, somebody have a copy of that that you just bought, I could use it. Not that one, I need the Earth Rising the Revolution title so I can quote from it as I'm walking through this. <laughs> yeah, that's the one I need to borrow for just a minute if you'd, if you'd bring it forward. Um, I can't remember them all. <laughs> Thank you very much, and I'll get that back to you. Um, the, the thing that uh, struck me about this, and, 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 and I'll show some more overheads on this, but there was a, a publication called Orienteer. It's a military journal published in uh, Russia. Um, there was an article uh, published there on mind effects that was pretty interesting to me. Um, this was reprinted in uh, the U.S. Army War College uh, quarterly called Perimeters. I believe it was the winter of 1998, but you, you can look it up. Um, and, and, and the article in the U.S., you can look up the article name on the Internet. It's called The Mind Has No Firewalls. And, the, and I'm just going to read one quote. It's a lengthy article, but I'll just read one quote that kind of puts this into perspective. And this is what it says. A psychotronic generator which produces a powerful electromagnetic em emanation capable of being sent through telephone lines, TV, radio networks, supply pipes, and incandescent lamps. This signal would manipulate the behavior of those in contact with the signal, unquote. Then he goes into a bunch of other um, ideas around the same theme, essentially saying that any of these carriers, uh, you, could, you could manipulate that signal so that you could create this FFR, this frequency following response. What's important, um, and I'll put this in context of, of, of even politics and marketing, the, the frequency following response is taught in every um, uh, college that teaches uh, psychology these days because they utilize um, th this knowledge. Now this is not restricted in terms of how you can utilize it. So something as simple um, as the flicker rate on a, a television screen can, is sufficient that within 20, 30 seconds to create that response in most people. Now when you come home, most people go home, they watch television, they're tired, they're fatigued, they sit down, they're watching the television, their husband or wife is hollering, dinner's ready, dinner's ready, and they're totally in trance, right? I mean, we've all seen it, everybody's laughing, right? You've seen it because you've been there. Um, and you are, you're in this light, sort of trance-like state. Well then you add in the flicker rate, and, and how you can tell there is a flicker rate, and whether it's a coherent rhythmic signal, just look at the white wall behind you when it's playing, and then you can get a, a, an idea of that. But you can then run the flicker rate in such a way that within just very few seconds, you actually are in a very suggestive state. The regular ad, the overt advertising hits you. Most people don't have firm opinions on very much, so you can move a percent or two of the population in a certain direction. For political purposes, you can see the ramifications of that pretty easily. If you remember during uh, George Bush Jr.'s first election, he got in trouble for using subliminals, where he's using words. And the Democrats and he had the rats and the stuff, you know, and, and then he got caught and they shut that down. Well, that, that's regulated and, and creates those kind of controversies, but the flicker rate, FFR, doesn't do it. And, and, and I want to mention that the easiest form of mind control, the easiest form, all you have to do is give the population a sense of anxiety, worry, or fear. And as, as soon as you have that in a population, you cannot reach your higher states of consciousness. It is impossible to reach your higher states of consciousness. So the easiest manipulation, the Baptist minister's known for years and the government's known even longer. <laughs> you know? and, and when you think about it, it's pretty simple. You know, if, if you can let go of the fear, then you can reach these higher states of consciousness where actually solutions can be developed and, and resolutions um, uh, uh, created. Uh, and, and I want to say a little bit more of that because I was, I was alluding to it um, earlier when I was talking about how many people sort of fall off the edge of this work. Usually it's, they, they begin to get fearful. They be, and in this the alternate energy field, you, know, you see a lot of fear, a lot of anxiety, uh, you're done. As soon as you're there, you're done. You're not going to be effective. You're probably not going to achieve your objectives unless it's strictly by mistake and the randomness of the odds. Um, that is the adversary. And, and I think as we step into each thing that we do, we should only step into what we know we can do. Do that first. The next thing reveals itself. You know, have a general direction. Do what you know absolutely in your heart and in your mind you can accomplish. You'll do it with confidence. You'll do it fearlessly. Um, and people have asked me, aren't you afraid, aren't you afraid? No, the answer is no. I never have been, and the minute I am, I stop this work because then I've gone beyond the capability that I believe I can achieve. And I think all of us have to start to think about that because the fact is if we're in fear and anxiety, we cannot function in the way that we were designed as human beings to function. And we're uh, people I'd known for over 10 years who had been kicked really, really hard by the establishment and stood up and st dusted themselves off and maintained their ethical line 
uh, and their direction. So we brought him in to talk about mind effects. And Ben Eastland actually was, was pretty interesting. And, and what he said is that when, when he went to DARPA, and he knew Tony Tether on a first name basis, he was running DARPA at the time, and most of the directors. And when he went around and sort of talked to them about um, mind effects, um, what he said to me is, when I asked him to come to the conference, he said, well, on a scale of one to 10, uh, 10 being the least interesting, uh, two, three years ago, I would have said no. He said, but now it's a one or a two because as he went through DARPA, nobody was laughing anymore. They take it very seriously. Uh, I mentioned I have a website. There's some do DARPA documents there that deal with this subject that are unclassified. We have probably seven, 800 pages of documents there, uh, materials there, um, and, it's, and that stuff's all free. I encourage you to go there. It's earthpulse.com, E-A-R-T-H-P-U-L-S-E.com. Um, so the mind effects issue became important to me um, and was important prior to getting involved in, in this work. Um, and, and I want to talk about some of the things that, these are just to remind me so I don't forget. Uh, this book, Between Two Ages, um, this is uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski. Many of you remember him. He's one of the founders of the Trilateral Commission. He was National Security Advisor to Jimmy Carter when he was President of the United States. Um, this book was written when he was at Columbia University um, back 